Sanjay Gupta, MD, CNN Saturday and Sunday morning, 7.30 Eastern. Everywhere you look, it seems a heart attack is just waiting to happen. More than a million heart attacks a year. That's one just about every 30 seconds, just in the United States. If you haven't had a heart attack yourself, you likely know someone who has. But I've got a secret to share. With what we know right now, we could see the last heart attack in America. I've been investigating this for over a year. I've got lessons to share, things you need to know, things your doctor may not tell you. I was lucky I didn't die of a heart attack. Former President Clinton, like so too many people, people was busy. Wait. And for years, he ignored warning signs from his heart. But in 2004, during an exhausting book tour, there was something different. I had a real tightness in my chest when I was getting off the airplane. And it was the only time I'd had it unrelated to exercise. We're here outside New York Presbyterian Hospital in just a couple of hours. President Bill Clinton, former president, is uh, scheduled to undergo surgery. So I immediately went down to our local hospital and they uh, did a test. They said, you got real problems. They hustled me down to Columbia Presbyterian and uh, they confirmed the determination that I had serious blockage and needed the surgeries. The doctors immediately knew options were limited. The 58-year-old Clinton needed to have his chest opened, his heart stopped, and surgery performed. There's no medical treatment for reversing the obstructions that have already formed in his blood vessels. They got Hillary and Chelsea there, and all I remember is it was happening fast, and everybody who cared about me was scared, and I felt rather serene. I thought, oh, gosh, we dodged a bullet. I didn't have a heart attack. On Labor Day in 2004, Mr. Clinton had four blood vessels bypassed. Starting this morning around 8 o'clock, he had a relatively routine quadruple bypass operation. Uh, we left the operating room around noon, and he is recovering normally at this point. So I think right now everything looks straightforward. There was that period when you're just not sure you can come back. That bothered me. That and the pain. If it happened to him, could it happen to you? What about me? I'm a pretty typical guy in his early 40s with a family history of heart disease. So I decided to go on a mission to never have a heart attack. But how? When people talk about trying to end heart attacks uh, in, in the world, or in America at least, one of the ways to do that is to take a look inside the heart, see what's happening before someone ever, ever has a problem. And that's what we're going to do here today. You're actually going to look for what in my heart? Yes, for calcium, which is part of the atherosclerotic process, the plaques in the heart. And if you were heading for a I've heart never attack, had a problem, but you're, you're looking for it anyways. Yes, and if you were heading for a heart attack in 5, 10, 20 years, you will already have plaque. It's a lifelong process. That's Dr. Arthur Agatston. You may recognize him as author of the South Beach Diet Books, but he also invented the coronary calcium scan. That's the test I'm having done. In case you're wondering, he doesn't make any money from it. We all know plaque is bad, blocks your blood vessels. Plaque is formed by LDL cholesterol in the blood, the bad cholesterol. Think of it as L for lousy, building up on the walls of your arteries, forming plaque. It can accumulate slowly over time, narrowing the blood vessels, like something building up inside a pipe. This narrowing in the blood vessels leading to your heart can cause chest pain, called angina. It can also cause a heart attack. Did you ever wonder how seemingly healthy people can have a heart attack? This may surprise you. Most heart attacks happen in people with no symptoms, in people whose arteries are less than 50% blocked. Here's how. Cholesterol can cause unstable bubbles or blisters of plaque to form in your arteries. These can be incredibly dangerous. Most are covered by a cap, but inflammation and stress can cause the cap to thin and rupture, resulting in a clot that blocks the flow of blood to the heart. 
Robbed of oxygen, the heart muscle can't function properly. Heart attack. And therein lies the key, Agatson says. We can now find clues before heart trouble gets dangerous, even before the first symptoms. Well before you get to the stage, President Clinton was. Bill Clinton, former president, arguably had at least eight years of some of the best health care in the world. It was after he left office, he had significant heart problems. That surprised a lot of people. How could it be that he could get this level of health care and still have heart problems? He had multivessel disease, so he had a lot of plaque. That plaque certainly could have been identified with a heart scan uh, years before. I don't want to sound glib, but w why wasn't it done? Because, again, you'd assume, you know, the White House doctors, the President of the United States, uh, they'd be doing that for him. Why yeah, not? It was not the standard of care then. Uh, we are past that. I decided to ask Bill Clinton about that. And it turns out he did have a coronary calcium scan just months after leaving office. But the technology was so new then, doctors weren't quite sure what to do with the results. They said I had some calcium buildup around my heart that put me uh, basically in the top third of risks, but they said there's no evidence of blockage because I'd done so well in the stress test. For a few months before this happened, I noticed whenever, uh, not, not every time, but often when I would do rather strenuous exercise, there are some really hilly areas in the town of Brown. I'd climb those hills and I'd stop and take a breath. I didn't take it seriously because every time it happened, I just lowered the exercise level, got my breath back, and it was never painful. It was just tight. If this isn't good for my heart, I don't know what is. <laughs> By the time he felt the first symptoms, that tightness in his chest, President Clinton's heart disease was well advanced. It had been decades in the making. You don't die with your first plaque you develop atherosclerosis blockages really your whole life um, for many, many years before it causes a heart attack or a stroke. And what Dr. Agatson told me next should ring a bell of hope for just about anyone who is ever worried about a heart attack. It doesn't have to happen. One of the best kept secrets in the country in medicine is that doctors who are practicing aggressive prevention are really seeing heart attacks and and strokes disappear from their practices. It's doable. And you're saying we, with what we know right now, we don't have to have any more heart attacks in this country? I'll never say not any, but the great majority. Yes, absolutely. It's the biggest killer of men and women, heart disease in this country. And it's completely preventable. Coming up, more tests to gauge my heart attack risk. And can you really tell who's a heart attack waiting to happen? Also. Can the right diet make you heart attack proof? We'll meet a woman who's betting her life on it. With a family history of heart disease and a lifetime of bad eating habits, President Clinton told me he was a heart attack waiting to happen. But what does someone really look like who is about to have a heart attack? You probably wouldn't think this guy. Tom Bear, 53, thin, seemingly healthy, and one step short of a full-blown heart attack. In fact, he's checking into this hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska for open-heart surgery. It's an important lesson. What you see on the outside doesn't always match the inside. In this instance, it obviously uh, closed down quite a bit. And he was Surgeon Ed Raines shows us the striking images on the angiogram of Bear's heart. You can see this tight narrowing right there where that closes down. So that limits the amount of blood that can get out. And then you've got it real tight narrowing right up here, where that vessel on the side takes off, and then another narrowing here. And then you've got a pretty tight narrowing there. All the major blood vessels supplying blood to the heart blocked. Yes, that is the very picture of a heart attack waiting to happen. He's at risk for heart attack just because of the amount of plaque that he has in there. Could he have prevented? Like me, Bear has a family history of heart disease. And that's why four years ago, he underwent the coronary calcium scan that we just learned about. His results were not good. The score was, 100, the, was 111. Zero is the best. Over 100 means an increased risk of heart attack, even sudden death. And you may breathe. You can go ahead, rest your arms down if you'd like. It's gonna take me a couple minutes to check these images, make sure we have everything we need. 
Bear went through the test again this year, and his score was up to 243. The average score for someone his age, five. I was doing some exercise about three weeks ago, um, a jogging routine that I do, and uh, made it about three-tenths of a mile, and then had the classic uh, symptoms, the chest pain, and then the pain down the, down the left arm, and shortness of breath. What room is this? This is room four. As in the case of Bill Clinton, Barra was told he had no options by the time he saw Dr. Raines. Within days, he would need bypass surgery. In this instance, you know, this is sort of a, what I would consider a medical failure. In other words, he got this, these narrowings in plaque despite our efforts to, to prevent it from, from progressing. And, and my goal would be, is, even though I'm a surgeon and treat these end-stage things, is, is to not have them get to this point. From a public health standpoint, we have to do this because this bypass operation is going to be very expensive. He's not kidding. Average cost in the U.S., $112,000, and there are about 450,000 procedures performed every year. Total price tag, more than $50 billion. Our money would be better spent years ahead of this to prevent the, him from getting to this point. prevent ever getting to this point. That is precisely my goal, for me and for you, the last heart attack. Dr. Arthur Agatston has guaranteed he can see trouble coming, years in advance, well before I'd need surgery, if I do the right tests. So here's where the blood is flowing, and this is the, the lining. Agatston is using an ultrasound to look for plaque in the carotid artery leading to my brain. A blockage here can cause a stroke and would be a sign I'm at increased risk for a heart attack. Unless you do the imaging and the, the advanced testing, you are really playing Russian roulette with your life. Your body needs cholesterol, actually makes it. It's in the lining of every cell in your body. The liver sends out LDL cholesterol, and when everything works right, the good HDL scavenges excess LDL and brings it back to the liver. You also get cholesterol in foods, Things like meat, french fries, eggs, butter, desserts, ice cream. Your cholesterol number is a good measure of what's in the blood. But here's the problem. It doesn't tell you if it's building up in the walls of your blood vessels, forming plaque. And it's the plaque that causes heart attacks. If you look in the coronary care unit and people have heart attacks, the cholesterol levels of those who have heart attacks versus those in the street who have it are essentially the same. That is kind of surprising, right? Because you'll hear people exchanging their cholesterol numbers. And if it's low, they seem quite proud of it. If it's high, there's cause for concern. You say that that's, you know what, you're not looking in the right place. That's essentially useless. Here's what does matter, Agatson says. The size of your LDL, or bad cholesterol particles. Larger LDL particles don't pose much of a threat because they pass through the blood vessels without sticking. It's the smaller LDL particles that are more likely to lodge in the walls of blood vessels and cause a buildup of plaque. If they're small, you can have a lot of little particles that penetrate the vessel wall more easily. There are a lot of little old ladies in their 80s with very high cholesterols who have squeaky clean vessels. They have very large cholesterol particles and they don't get into the vessel wall. So you have to ask about the size of the particles as well when it comes to bad yes. cholesterol. That's why Dr. Agatston wants a blood sample. I don't think anybody likes getting their blood drawn. Oh. He wants to find out if I have a lot of small LDL particles, a sign that I could be prone to building up plaque no matter what my overall cholesterol number is. Coming up. I was incredibly lucky that something more severe didn't happen. Lessons from former President Clinton and the pictures don't lie. I learn if my arteries are young or old. Time to find out what fate has to sure. offer me. And a controversial diet. This 66-year-old woman says she's eating her way to heart health. We're never going to end the epidemic with stents, with bypasses, with the drugs, because none of it is treating causation of the illness. Spend just a few moments with Bill Clinton, 
and you'll see he's a changed man. For starters, he's a lot thinner than he was as president. When his half-hearted exercise routine really out of shape, though. and his taste for fast food became the stuff of parody. Your McNugget is released from Great Britain to Somalia, intercepted by warlords. Dr. Dean Ornish has studied and written about diet and heart disease for decades. Mrs. Clinton asked me if I would work with uh, the, the chefs who cook for the, the first family, and then began working with President Clinton directly as one of his consulting physicians. The president did like unhealthy foods, and we were able to put soy burgers in the White House, for example, and uh, have them uh, get foods that were delicious and nutritious. But even with Dr. Ornish's help, in 1999, after his annual physical, the White House doctor said the president had put on 18 pounds since a checkup just two years earlier. That's the problem. It all looks good. While diet and exercise can go a long way, most doctors will tell you to get to the last heart attack in America, there is more. It's rather public knowledge that he was going through some rather stressful times during that time. And it just goes to show you that information alone is not sufficient. We need to work at a deeper level. We need to work with the underlying stresses that people are experiencing, the loneliness, the isolation in many cases that people are experiencing. And then taking the weight towards the balls of the feet. That's why Dr. Ornish's prescription for heart patients oh, includes yeah. yoga. The mind will begin to quiet down. Meditation and group sessions at his institute in Sausalito, California. I came to Vermont determined to get my cholesterol down <laughs> with low-fat Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia. We now know when Bill Clinton was president, he passed his annual physicals, but his heart disease was still progressing, undetected. I asked his cardiologist why. One lesson is that uh, checkups are not a substitute for lifestyle. As president, Bill Clinton never got any of the advanced imaging, like the coronary calcium scan or the ultrasound of his carotid. Those are tests that are now more readily available to everyone. And Clinton was also getting a false sense of assurance from the testing he did have. And it was the year he left office when he had the first symptoms of heart disease. In 2001, when Chelsea was graduating from Stanford, I started running again. I wanted to get in good shape. And I thought, this is crazy. I couldn't run more than three quarters of a mile without stopping and walking 100 yards and getting my breath back. Three years later, the bypass operation with Dr. Craig Smith. But President Clinton's heart troubles were not over. When the devastating earthquake struck Haiti in 2010, President Clinton flew to Port-au-Prince to support the relief efforts. I spent time with him and saw that he looked tired, not himself. Got all pale and weak. And then uh, I got all these letters from the, you know, the doctor crowd saying, yeah, it's normal because fools like you won't do what you're supposed to do because you don't eat like you should, you don't exercise like you should. The doctor said it was a mechanical failure of the bypass and he needed stents to open the blocked artery. I got so lucky they were able to put those two stents in, you know, and, and fix an artery that had been, it was pretty bent and ugly. The goal of the treatment, and I think it will be achieved, is for President Clinton to resume his uh, very active lifestyle. Uh, this was not a result of um, either his lifestyle or his diet, which have been excellent. But Dr. Dean Ornish didn't see it that way. And so I wrote him a letter, and I said, you know, the friends that mean the most to me are the ones that tell me what I need to hear, not necessarily what I want to hear. And you need to know that your genes are not your fate, that, and I say this not to blame you, but to empower you, and I'm happy to work with you to whatever extent you, you want to move forward in that way. And we met a few days later, and he said he was ready to do it. I essentially concluded that I had just played Russian roulette because even though I had changed my diet some and cut down on the caloric total of my ingestion and cut back on how much of the high cholesterol food I was eating, I still, without any scientific basis to support what I did, 
was taking in a lot of extra cholesterol without knowing whether my body would produce enough of the enzyme to dispose of it. And clearly it didn't, or I wouldn't have had that blockage. So that's when I made a decision to really change. I should have done it after the surgery. Coming up, President Clinton transforms his diet to save his heart. And what is life like after heart surgery? Tom Bear's painful recovery and his complications. Walked about three tenths of a mile and it was excruciating. Also, she said no to surgery and yes to food as medicine. We'll tell you if it's working. In Lincoln, Nebraska, 53-year-old teacher Tom Bear has emerged from three and a half hour bypass surgery, an operation that required his heart to be stopped for more than an hour. He's in the cardiac intensive care unit. It's the first stop on a slow, painful recovery. Uh, a little stiff, a little sore, a little hoarse, a little tired, but other than that, pretty good. Bear doesn't know it yet, but he's heading for a life-threatening complication, one that will soon have him back in the operating room. It's nice to be home. You can, they say you heal, you heal 10 times faster and you feel 100% better. I didn't have any idea of how, how uh, uncomfortable I was gonna be just doing little things. Like getting out of bed in the morning was the hardest thing to do. Life after bypass surgery. For Tom Bear, it means it's three weeks before he takes his first walk outside and gets a painful warning of trouble ahead. A little worried back there, my arm's starting to hurt. That's gone now, it's just hard to catch my breath. I spoke to Tom Bear right before his operation. What happened? Um, none of the arteries uh, uh, worked. Did they say that this was pretty, uh, pretty unusual? Um, never seen before. Wow. That's uh, it's, uh, not the kind of luck you want. Uh, no, <laughs> no, not at all. So Dr. Ains is gonna use veins today. Serious complications are an unfortunate part of the process for 12% of the people who have bypass surgery. In fact, one in 300 patients need a second operation within two years, and one in 20 receives stents during that time. Bill Clinton needed to have one of his blood vessels reopened six years after his operation. After getting the stents to open up that blocked artery in 2010, former President Clinton says he decided to make changes in his diet. This time around, he decided to get much more strict, radical even, in his approach. No more meat, no more eggs, no more dairy, almost no oil. The mantra is, eat nothing that has a mother or a face. Talked about the fact that you love to eat. I mean, this is I know, I mean, you know, I like the stuff I eat. I like the vegetables, the fruits, the, the beans, the, the stuff I eat now, I like. I, I like it. Do you call yourself a vegan now, then? Well, I suppose I am if I don't eat dairy or meat or fish, you know. So you, you've cut all that out. I mean, do you, do you crave The it? only thing, once in a while, and literally in uh, well over a year now, at Thanksgiving, I had one bite of turkey. I mean, you're doing this for your health. Is yes, that why you're doing it? Absolutely. Clinton's dietary guides, Dean Ornish, and this guy, Caldwell Esselstyn, at the Cleveland Clinic. Apparently he read my book. I've never met the man. Dr. Esselstyn has written him, though. Well, he wrote me a letter saying he thought I was even cheating on mine because he was afraid in my protein drink I had some dairy in there. <laughs> It was hilarious. And I checked, and on one of them, he was right. I'd only done it once. You but checked he was it right. out. Yeah, I did. Every month, the 77 year old Esselstyn holds a day long seminar, attracting doctors and heart patients from across the country, like Sharon Kintz, a retired private investigator from Canton, Ohio. Kintz had a heart attack six months earlier after a coronary artery became completely blocked. He said, for someone who had what you have, the only warning you usually get is death. 
And at that point, I really knew how lucky I was. Like a lot of women, Kintz did not experience the classic chest pain, but rather fatigue and a pain in her jaw. He said, uh, you're going to have to have open heart surgery. He says, I can fix you today. I can just take you right down to OR, and I can operate on you right now. My son was in there, and he was ready to wheel me down to the operating room because he is frantic. You know, it's terrifying. What Kintz did next may surprise you. She turned the surgeon down cold, said no to open heart surgery, and decided to take a chance. I bought some parsnips the other day. Always have sweet potatoes on hand. Using food as medicine. I love these. These are wonderful. Mm -hmm. so like President them. Clinton, Kintz has given up the food she loves, like butter and cheese. She's betting her life on Dr. Esselstyn's diet. She had a heart attack. Oh, yeah, I know. You know, Sharon. Oh, yeah. Doctors recommended she have an intervention. She's not doing it. Is there a downside? Could she be putting herself at risk? No. I think that's an excellent question. In hundreds of patients, data now going back over 20 years and more of this more recent study about a decade, once they start eating this way, you'll make yourself heart attack proof. Going heart back attack over proof. We know that if people are eating this way, they are not going to have a heart attack. Esselstyn thinks heart disease is completely preventable, no matter what sort of family history you have, simply by eating right. It's a foodborne illness, and we're never going to end the epidemic with stents, with bypasses, with the drugs, because none of it is treating causation of the illness. Esselstyn has won some allies, like Dr. Terry Mason. Is there anybody who doesn't know what it is? Chief Medical Officer at Cook County Hospitals in Chicago and the city's former public health commissioner. We've eaten ourselves into a problem, and we can eat ourselves out of it. But it also puts Esselstyn squarely against conventional wisdom, which considers diet only a part of a heart-healthy lifestyle. If a doctor were to say to me, look, heart disease is a foodborne disease. If you follow this diet, pretty strict diet, very restrictive, but in exchange, you're not going to have a heart attack. What would you say to that? You agree with that? I would say that's an overstatement, uh, an oversimplification and an overstatement of really what we're able to do, even though I know there are people who say it. Welcome to sunny Cleveland. Without a doubt, Esselstyn is one of those people. A general surgeon by training, not a cardiologist, and he holds no special degree in nutrition. But during his research, he came upon a stunning fact. Some cultures around the world, like people living in Central Africa, Papua New Guinea Highlanders, and Tarahumara Indians in Mexico, have virtually no heart disease. None. So what can we learn from them? Coming up, taking a page from the heart healthiest spots on the globe, the diet. Dr. Esselstyn says, can make you heart attack proof. Mr. President, how are you? Since leaving office, Bill Clinton has made his own health and the health of the country his top domestic priority. I saw it firsthand when he invited me to Little Rock. Last time we spoke a few weeks ago, you said uh, you were going to be really strict on the diet. You were doing a pretty good job, you said. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm being more, more strict now. Are you? Mm -hmm. So, so. Yeah, by the time I have my 65th birthday, I want to weigh what I did when I went home from law school in 1973. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm working That's a grand for. ambition. I like that. So okay, we'll how see much was I'm, that? Will you tell us? Mm -hmm. I weighed, I got down to 185. All right. Now, I got down when I, when Chelsea was married, I weighed about 192, which is what I weighed when I graduated from high school. Anything under 195 was my optimum weight my whole life. But in the summer of 73, we had a scorching hot summer, and I ran three miles a day at the hottest hour of the day, which I could do back then, in order to make the pounds go off. And it was the first time since I was 13 years old that I'd weighed 185 pounds. So I'm going to try one more time to right. make it. President Clinton's diet, no meat, no dairy, almost no oil, got me thinking how different what he's eating now as compared to what he used to eat and what most of us still eat make a habit of high-fat, high-cholesterol meals like this, and you can physically see the beginnings of heart disease. For starters, your blood actually looks different. So let's start by looking at what healthy blood looks like after it has been centrifuged or spun. You can see there are two components. 
This bottom layer represents the blood cells, and this top layer represents the plasma. The plasma is a clear yellow layer that contains mostly water and electrolytes. Here's what happens to your blood if you follow an unhealthy diet. The top layer is white and cloudy. It's just laden with heart-clogging fat and cholesterol. You have some easy-to-remember adages about how people can decide what they should or should not eat. We know what they shouldn't eat. That is <laughs> oil, dairy, meat, fish, and chicken. What do we want them to eat? We want them to eat all those whole grains for their cereal bread and pasta, beans, vegetables, yellow, red, green, and fruit. Now, what particular vegetables do we want them to have? Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprout, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. And I'm out of breath. <laughs> nothing with the mother, nothing with the face. You can imagine the meat, egg, and dairy associations think that's a terrible idea. Incorporating lean beef into a healthy diet can actually help you stick to a healthy diet because it's a food that people enjoy. Eggs are a source of 13 vitamins and minerals. Eggs are the gold standard when it comes to protein. Well, dairy foods are very nutrient rich. You get a lot of nutrients for every calorie that you consume. A plant-based diet like Dr. Esselstyn's runs up against our meat-loving culture. Most doctors eat meat because most Americans eat meat. And so if they don't really see for themselves or their own families why it might be a good idea to cut back or even cut meat out of your diet altogether, then they may not be so inclined to recommend it for their patients. Even doctors who do see the benefits of the Esselstyn diet may not recommend it to patients. Anybody who's able to do that diet can have dramatic success. The problem is, is that many people are unable or unwilling to make these changes. And so in my practice, I try to take you know, baby steps one step at a time. And Dean Ornish says when it comes to diet, it's not all or nothing. One of the interesting findings in all of our studies was that the more people change their diet and lifestyle, the more they improved in direct proportion. I was curious about the science behind Dr. Esselstyn's claims. So I dug up some of these peer-reviewed journals. They're small, just a handful of patients, but the results are pretty impressive. In one study here, patients on the Esselstyn diet and cholesterol-lowering medication had no heart attacks, had no coronary events of any sort, after five years. And three quarters of these patients actually saw their blockages get smaller. So you're not talking about just reducing your chance of heart disease. You're talking about potentially re reversing heart disease. Oh, absolutely. The late wisdom is that once you, you develop these plaques, they're there. You're stuck with them. Try not to let them get worse. Is that faulty thinking? I think it's uh, absolutely faulty thinking. Here's a picture Esselstyn likes to show of a heart patient with a blocked coronary artery. And here's that same patient after going on a plant-based diet. You see the way the blockage has almost disappeared? Sharon Kintz survived a heart attack a year ago after a coronary artery became completely blocked. Now she's counting on the Esselstyn diet to keep her from having another. Thankfully, your heart muscle function is normal. Kintz cardiologist Adnan Zaidi says, so far so good with the diet. It's a difficult sell, but you know, those who get onto it, uh, have benefited from it without a question. I asked Sharon Kintz to meet me here in New York City. You know, cooking at home is one thing, but eating on the road, eating on the run, well, that's quite another. As the old saying goes, if her diet can make it here, it can make it anywhere. 46th and Broadway, please. Sharon, how are you? You cook at home, it's, it's a lot more in your control. What's the most difficult thing when you're on the road? What I see here is I see uh, pizza, which is not, because I'm sure there's oil in it, and pizza, and that looks like pepperoni. When I look up here, I see pasta. Right. So my question would be when I go in, do you have whole wheat pasta? And then my second question is, can you prepare it without oil? That's that, not. No. That's a not. That's a not. That's not. But they have pasta and they have salad. All right, so here's a, uh, another restaurant. Okay. I'm going I'm to take some advice from you. You look at a menu like this. Yeah. Tell me what comes to your mind. The majority on there, I'm not going to eat. So are you just uh, focusing on no, salads? No, not really. I could have the baby spinach leaves minus the chicken. I could have the peaches, the strawberries, forget the walnuts. And Is this a restaurant that you would oh, yeah. come in and If I was hungry, you bet. You could get a meal here. You bet I could. Kintz is a true believer. So is former President Bill Clinton. 
And nowadays, they have a lot of high-powered company. All of these CEOs and former CEOs are either vegetarians or vegans. Coming up, plaque starts in childhood. What some schools are doing now so kids don't get heart disease later. And Dr. Agatston tells me Doctor, if I should be worried. Sanjay, good to see you. The former president once told me he likes to see results. He's helped with relief efforts after the tsunami in Asia and the earthquake in Haiti. He's worked on getting affordable AIDS drugs to Africa. He and his foundation are now seeing results closer to home, like at the Northeast Elementary Magnet School in Danville, Illinois. On your mark, get set, go! At Northeast Magnet, students have phys ed every day. More than one in five schools in the United States don't require PE at all. Fresh fruits and vegetables are on the menu every day. No more fried foods, no more french fries. Fruits and vegetables at every school lunch. Again, that seems like that should just be the way it is. It shows you how far afield we've gotten. There were so many people, schools, that were serving lunches that didn't have fruits and vegetables because they contracted with firms to provide them and they were trying to save money. And the kids were happy to eat pizza and french fries or whatever. Right. And when we started this, I think I told you years ago, I didn't know if we could, how much of a dent we could make in this, because we changing the culture is hard. It's, it's turning a ship around before it hits the iceberg. <laughs> but I think we're beginning to turn it around. Does anybody know what a cardiologist is? Dr. Arthur Agatston is also focused on improving the eating habits of young people. I really think you guys should open a restaurant. Did you learn how to do this here? The South Beach Diet author started a foundation working with students in Philadelphia on healthy eating. Mm. Wow. Efforts like these come at a time when obesity and diabetes, both risk factors for heart disease, are at all-time highs. And in the next 20 years, the American Heart Association predicts 33 million more Americans will have heart disease, unless we change. And we're very concerned because we are seeing the risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease increasing. Would you call yourself healthy now? Well, I think I'm healthier than I was. You know, I'm, I lost 20 something pounds. All my blood tests are good. All my vital signs are good. And I feel good and I actually have, believe it or not, more energy. I seem to need less sleep. Once you begin making these changes, most people find they feel so much better so quickly it reframes the reason for making these changes from fear of dying to joy of living. And joy is what's sustainable. Left leg up, bend it at the knee, reach back with your right hand. A year into her diet, a year after her heart attack, Kent says she feels great. Simply walking tired her out 12 months ago. Sharon, do you think this diet's gonna make you live longer? Well, I hope so. I hope I, hope I get to see you retire. <laughs> I have a feeling you're gonna have to live a very long time, <laughs> which, I, which I hope you do. I hope I, hope I do too. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think. Uh, well, you know what? If it doesn't, if I don't live longer, I know I'm gonna live more of a quality life. And Sharon Kintz is doing it using food as medicine. For Tom Bear, it was a tougher road. He required surgery. I was told I was gonna feel like a million dollars. Um, and I, um, that hasn't happened yet. So I'm still waiting for that, that, uh, that, that payoff. I'm told that um, I'm good for another 40 years or so. Um, and I'm hoping that's the case, but with my history, I'm gonna have to watch it. So what about me? I have a family history. Am I heart attack proof? So a couple of weeks ago, I met up with Dr. Arthur Agatston uh, to get a full workup, to gauge my likelihood of actually having a heart attack. Sanjay, good to see you. Time to find out. Time to see what fate has to offer. Sure. Me. Now, we, we had some good news when we did the imaging. Right. That you had no plaque in your coronary arteries right. on the calcium score. Right. That your carotids were really uh, like a spring chicken, very young. Like, like somebody that. in their yeah. 20s. Someone made a comment to me that it, it, this is sort of a four year guarantee that yes. I won't have a heart attack. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yes. I, I'd extend it to five to seven years. Five, so, but you can uh, say, based on what you've already seen before we yes. even go over this, five to seven years, 
if I'm feeling chest pain, it's probably not a heart attack. Right. 